the past 25 years, more people have left the church than those who started attending church during the Great Awakening, the Second Great Awakening, and the Billy Graham Crusades combined. The Great Awakening, Second Great Awakening, the Billy Graham Crusades combined, that amount is less than those who have exited the church in the past 25 years. It's not something that happened simply with lockdowns or restrictions of the pan pandemic, although that sped up some of the process. Uh, Jim Davis and, and Michael Graham discussed in their book The Great Dechurching uh, several categories for those that are leaving the church. But two basic categories are helpful for us to think about this morning. The casually dechurched and the dechurched casualties. The casually dechurched and the dechurched casualties. The first is those who gradually drop off the radar. It could be because of relocation, change of life circumstances, or more. The group typically didn't intend to stop coming to church, but over time, they get out of the habit, they grow more irregular, then they stop coming altogether. The de-church casualties are those who have experienced deep hurt from the church and often refuse to go back because of what they've experienced. When we think about how to be a healthy church in a de-churched age, we need to think about both types. We also need to think about this by way of prevention and restoration. A healthy church will be one that, by God's grace, prevents future dechurching, and one that can be a place of restoration and reconnection for those who've become disconnected. I believe that our church is perfectly primed to have tremendous impact in a dechurched age. How does that take place? How are we healthy in a time like this? I want to think through three images this morning. Three specific images that if we, we grasp these, if we capture this, and we, we don't have time to, to address them all comprehensively, but hopefully just give us little pictures for what this might look like that we can think upon, that we can ruminate over as we think about being a healthy church in a de-churched age. So by God's grace, just give us a heads up where we're heading, and then we'll unpack each of them. By gra God's grace, let us strive to be a safe house for the hurting, a greenhouse to grow, and a lighthouse to the nations. A safe house for the hurting, a greenhouse to grow, and a lighthouse to the nations. We want both preventative and restorative measures when it comes for those who are living the church. First, we want to be a church that people don't want to leave. A safe house. Perhaps you're here for a bit, to get a degree, to advance your career. Whatever the case, we want this to be a safe haven for you, a place that's difficult to leave. And if the Lord were to take you somewhere in the near future, it's hard. There's a sting, because you loved your church. Maybe it's a place of healing from past church hurt or from difficult life circumstances. If you're a regular part of this local church, my hope is that you can be a contributing member so that we are a safe house for the hurting. There's a precedent for being a safe house for the hurting, a precedent in the character and nature of Jesus himself. Now this in Matthew 11, 28 and 29. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Some this morning need rest. Some this morning are burdened. So that sounds good. Life is hard. Life is difficult. And it talks about the character and the nature of, of Jesus, his very heart. It says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Why? Because I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. In Christ there is rest. Jesus is gentle and lowly in heart. Some of you may be aware of Dane Ortland's terrific book on the topic called Gentle and Lowly. 
where he unpacks the importance of this statement and how it's etched throughout the pages of Scripture. Jesus isn't looking to pounce on you. He has a disposition of gentleness to all who come to him. Davis and Graham, in their book, The Great Dechurching, write this. Over the past 50 years, it appears fewer people are asking, is Jesus true? And more asking, is Jesus good? And is Jesus beautiful? Unfortunately, we can communicate the truth of Jesus in a way that undermines his goodness, that undermines his beauty. As we strive to be a church that is good, beautiful, and true, we need to recognize that unfortunately this isn't always the case. As one apologist put it, maybe not super eloquently, but truthfully, many de church people we encounter may instinctively see Christians as jerks. What's your initial reaction to that? Is it defensive? Does it wonder why? Does it understand why that could be the case? If we're going to be a safe house for the hurting, we can do this first by remembering Jesus is gentle and lowly. Remembering who our Savior is. His disposition towards those who are hurting. We can also do so by having a clear position and yet a gentle posture. It's hard to be a contributing member to a safe house when we live in a world of echo chambers. We live in a tribal world. A world that's out for for my team, my tribe. We even hint at phrases or things that might signal that we're on somebody else's team so we know if they're the good guys or the bad guys. We might even drop politically charged terminology in order to assess that, like where do you align? Are you on my team or not? These are the tactics of tribalism, not Christian unity. This is the posture of hostility, not the posture of love. We will have various positions, and some of them will differ within this congregation. Sincere convictions that we dearly care about, but that we can disagree with compassion. There are other things that we must hold together as a local church. Positions that Scripture clearly teaches that we cannot compromise on. Firm positions. And yet we can be loving and gentle in our posture towards others. I believe that the EFCA has done a great job kind of navigating these waters. Recently, they, they published a, a statement of affirmations and denials. These are things that we cling to, and these are things that we, we don't. And they're hitting on hot topic issues, sexuality, gender. And they're doing so both holding firm a biblical position and yet being tender and loving and compassionate. Both conviction and compassion. Both firm in biblical position and yet gentle in posture. We read from the EFCA Statement of Faith, specifically on gender. We do not believe that a person's biological sex must be separated from their self-perception as a man or woman, nor that the body should be altered when it does not conform to that self-perception. But we do believe that some people experience a distressing struggle between these two, and that we must treat those who struggle in this way with love and compassion as we seek to help them. With the truth and the power of the gospel, towards the wholeness of a biologically, biologically sex identity grounded in God's very good design in creation as male and female. So do we see the wording? It's not loud. It's not condemning. It's clear in both conviction and compassion as a posture of love while holding a biblical position. And this statement can offend in two directions. Some want more to be said, more anger. Others see it as unloving, 
and are angry that the position is not different. Clear in position and yet abounding in compassion. That's what we're called to be. Also called to be a, a safe place for people to process. Many are leaving the church because their genuine questions are met with hostility. And parents can be guilty of this. And data shows that they factor in. Unfortunately, we can over-explain things to kids when they're little and give no explanation when they're older. A safe house for the hurting or to prevent future hurt is to have spaces for people to process and wrestle through things. A good piece of advice I read in studying this week said this, we would all be wise to trade our defensiveness for curiosity. A genuinely curious posture helps others feel heard, understood, and safe. Do we have places for people to prosper or process? Maybe it's your dinner table with friends. Maybe it's your life group. What spaces do we have for people to wrestle through the questions that they have? These spaces are typically smaller that allow for more openness and more vulnerability. It could be an organic conversation over coffee. It could be a formal setting. But is there spaces for this? To wrestle through deep questions that we have. We'll come back to this a little bit as we talk about this, this next concept. So first we want to be this safe house for the hurting. Those who are hurt, those who are wrestling through things. But we also want to be a greenhouse to grow. A greenhouse to grow. Janae touched on the Great Commission as uh, she unpacked um, and let her, us know uh, what, what she's uh, how she's ministering, um, and, I, and I love the Great Commission, and she stole my line um, in that. And so I'll, I'll go back to that. But go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. A greenhouse uh, to grow. Uh, go and make disciples, not converts. Right? Commissioning disciples to have a life of making disciples. It's not just true for the, at that time, it's a commission to all who follow Christ. And this can and should take place in the local church as well. Ephesians 4 gives us a picture of the church being built up by teaching and by life together. The book of Acts discusses how a church dedicated themselves to the apostles' teaching. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 5, the church was rebuked because they were not growing. A healthy church is a greenhouse for disciples to grow, a place where we are always growing. Unfortunately, sometimes in the Christian life, we can have two kinds of knowledge. The things I already know and the things I don't need to know. Things I already know and things I don't need to know. Like, so those could be our two categories. But the idea of us trying to arrive or thinking that we've arrived in our knowledge is the fastest route to stagnation. We just stay there. Christians are always growing. They're always learning. And many have, have left the church because they felt like it superficially dealt with real-life problems or avoided hard teaching in order to accommodate to culture. If the church didn't take what it believed seriously enough to teach it, what was the point of coming? So how does this growth process take place? It takes place by providing both food and exercise. Both food and exercise. Growing uh, involves both of them. We're not merely concerned with conversion, but helping others grow. Believers whose faith informs all of their life, impacting the way they care for their family, their job, and their neighbors. And growth leads to evangelism and to service. 
While many churches have mission statements, ours included, the main emphasis for all local churches is derived from the biblical imperatives of discipleship and evangelism. The faith of a mature Christian necessarily spills out to those around them. By equipping the saints, they're more confident in their faith. They're more prepared to give an answer. There's no pitting discipleship and evangelism against each other or service and learning against each other. Both are necessary to grow, to be spiritually fit. Now, for somebody to, to work out and I wanted to, to build muscle, what was necessary? Right? What's necessary if you want to build muscle, you need a high protein diet. But you can't just have a high protein diet. Because if you just keep eating more and more, I'm, I'm bulking up and I'm never exercising, well, that's just going to turn to sluggishness. You're just having excess calories. There's no muscle development. No, you need the right nutrition, but you also need the right stimulus. You need the right exercise. You need to signal to the muscle, hey, I need to grow. There's something taking place here. In the same way in the Christian life. Some of us, we, we love to learn. We love to, to dive in. We, we could study all week. And yet our service, our reaching out is lacking. We're gorging ourselves on a, even a good diet, but not having the proper stimulus to grow. And others, we serving, 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 and not feeding yourself well. And that doesn't end well either. About a year and a half ago, two years, I said, I need to, I need to lose weight. And so I need to go on this, this journey. And so over the course of uh, nine months or so, I lost 50 pounds. And um, near the end, I was really cutting because the beach was coming, right? Um, and, and so I was really cutting, uh, but uh, I was still doing, uh, my, my food intake was, was reduced, but I was still exercising a lot because I, I wanted to re- ma- maintain that strength. I wanted to, to look good. And so I was still going. And uh, one morning I was taking a shower and I passed out in the shower. And I got up and passed out again. I didn't have enough nutrition to sustain the exercise. Both are necessary. Some of us may be burned out from the church. Serving, 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 and not being fed, not being fed, not being fed. Burnout. Others are being fed, being fed, being being fed, and you're not growing because you're not serving. Both are necessary. And I love the opportunities that we have to even exercise to be able to, to have these things like community events, weekly service. Like, loving our family well. And I've personally seen this in real time. People start to have, like, their, their, their muscles shrink they have, because they're not serving. Perhaps they were overcommitted at one point and they pull back so much that they're affected. Like an athlete who wears a cast or is in a hospital for a period of time, they start to lose muscle mass. The good news is there's muscle memory. You didn't lose what you know. You can jump back in. You can exercise those muscles again. If you want to grow, I'd encourage you, be involved at least one smaller group setting. And serve in some way. The setting might be life groups, equipping the saints time, Bible study. Each of these benefit in in various ways. It'd be great if you're plugged into all of them. But if you're not plugged into one, pick one and be consistent. Allows you to know others better, to learn in a different way. It helps you to know and be known by those around you. And serve. We're a church where, where everyone's serving. It's one thing we're trying to instill in our kids. If you see them handing out the bulletins as, the, as, as you're coming in, church where service just makes sense. And, and this is a church that serves. We, we love that. So many people serving in a variety of ways all throughout the week. Growing also gives confidence and patience when sharing. 
if we are growing in our understanding, if we are growing in our maturity, that allows us to slow down and understand where others are coming from. It allows us to have a certain level of confidence that we can be patient with others. Sometimes we're defensive, we're insensitive, we lash out when others are wrestling through and have true questions in their faith. And the reason we're defensive, the reason we're lashing out is because we have doubts ourselves. We're not well-grounded ourselves. The more well-grounded we are, the more patient we can be. The more we can sit in the posture of listener and try to understand where they're coming from, how we can best teach them based on where they're coming from. Hopefully, we can do that through Bible studies, classes, things like that here. Hopefully, Sunday mornings, as we, as we learn, as we grow together, it'll create in us a, a patience and a love for others. So many who have left the church and, and who have been hurt in the process need somebody to walk slowly alongside them to care about where they're coming from the questions that they have. I, I, Janae did not, did not plan this. I didn't talk to her beforehand. But I, I love, as, as, as she's talking about uh, her, her ministry, like what she's doing, she's like patient conversations, talking, hearing their stories. Like she's just stealing everything. <laughs> and, and I love it. Right. You don't know, Jay, Janae, she is uh, such a blessing. Uh, such a blessing in this church and, and continually uh, just meeting people weekly and I just... Uh, uh, what, what a neat, neat fit uh, and just an example even this morning of um, a healthy uh, church member uh, contributor uh, to this, this local church I guess you're not members yet, right? Um, but uh, looking, <laughs> looking for that process uh, a greenhouse to grow happens when we're doing it together Finally, uh, a lighthouse to the nations. A lighthouse to nations. What happens when our nation, the nations are in our backyard? We love our neighbor and we point them to Jesus. I, I love this church's heartbeat for international students and how we can love the nations by loving others right here in State College. The church's greatest apologetic, our greatest testimony to our faith is our love for one another. It says in Matthew 5, you are the light of the world. You, there is plural. So from the south, y'all are the light of the world. A city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. We're the light of the world. Or to put it differently, we're a lighthouse to the nations. How? Because we reflect Jesus like the moon reflects the sun. And when this takes place, they see our good works and they understand it's not us, it's Christ in us, and that's how God is glorified. So how does this happen practically? Uh, how, do, how do we practically do this? Well, we could be a lighthouse of the nations by coming to worship. Right? That's not super practical. Right? Think about this. In an age where individuals clamor to make much of themselves, where they're endlessly divided, we can show another way forward simply by coming to worship the true king. How are we a light in a de-churched age? By being a church people by understanding that God is worthy to be worshipped, that our presence matters, that others need us and we need them. And it matters if we want to hand our faith to the next generation. 
The way forward can be shown through the past. In the second century, we find these words describing Christians. I love it. Christians are not distinguished, this is the quote, Christians are not distinguished from the rest of mankind by country, by speech, or by dress. For they dwell in Greek or barbarian cities according to each man's lot that has been cast, and follow the customs of the land in clothing and food and other matters of daily life. Yet the condition of citizenship which they exhibit is wonderful and admittedly strange. They live in countries of their own, but simply as sojourners. They share the life of citizens, they endure the lot of foreigners. Every foreign land to them is a fatherland, and every fatherland is a foreign land. They spend their existence upon earth, but their citizenship is in heaven. They obey the Savage laws, and in their own lives, they surpass the laws. By simply living faithfully in this world, Christians are the light of the world. The passage doesn't say that we become the light of the world, but that we are the light of the world. We simply need to be what we already are. Coming to worship is a practical indication that our allegiance is to another, a kingdom that is not of this world. We come to give to God what is God's, us, ourselves. We also need to guard against obscuring our witness through our sin. We can hide this light under a basket by the way that we treat one another. We can obscure it by dividing over things of this world. Many of the D church say they left because of how politically charged the church was. While our faith certainly has political implications, good Christians can and will differ on the way those implications are implemented in a fallen world. When we start to adopt the divisive attitude of this world around us, we aren't showcasing that our citizenship, a citizenship that is wonderful and admittedly strange, a citizenship that's in heaven. We can also be a lighthouse to the nations by caring for others. A citizenship will be marked by our love for one another. This week I, I heard a story about one of our members taking um, a young mom in need in our congregation is to the hospital and sitting with her for several hours. She didn't do this for a claim. She didn't do this so that it would be mentioned. She did this simply out of love. And this is the body of Christ. The body of Christ caring for one another and loving each other is a terrific apologetic to a divided and fighting world. And also be a lighthouse to the nations by loving our neighbors personally and corporately. Just this week, I heard of a member of the church uh, who made a meal for one of their neighbors whose husband recently had a stroke. A tangible way to, to love someone else, to care. And we should look for practical ways to love others while also seeking opportunities to love them spiritually. There are many who are hurting, but in many of the majority of those who are de-churched say they would come to church if they met a new friend or if it was a new life circumstance like a move. We live in State College, Pennsylvania. There's people coming in all the time. There's opportunities for, to meet new people, to invite them to church. It's, it's funny because Emily mentioned earlier that I, there's people in here that I don't know and how that's interesting, <laughs> which it is, because Emily knows everybody. <laughs> and it's hard to go to like even an event and you're meeting new people and you're like, how did, how did you come? How do you hear about this? Well, Emily invited me. <laughs> it's just a practical and, and a lot of times it's how did you meet her? I don't I buy nothing or there's, there's different ways that just, just practical little, little opportunities that uh, I met her this way, and, and she invited me. Uh, what what a, a neat example of just practical invitation in loving others. We can also love uh, our neighbors corporately by caring them through the, for them through ministries that we support, out of the cold homeless ministry, pregnancy resource clinic, ministries that we support, missionaries that we send to love others around the world, Campus ministries that we support. Those who are involved in a campus ministry and the local church are three times less likely 
to leave the church. It's also through community events that we have as a practical way to love our neighbors. Talk about Fall Fest coming up. Uh, this week I heard about a, a story of a young member of ours uh, who on his bus uh, had uh, invitations to come uh, to uh, our end of summer event and was just passing them out, right? Uh, just, just making it rain on the bus, passing them to his, all his friends because uh, he wanted them to come. Now, did his friends come? They didn't. But what a great heart for him, just, just, just reaching out. Just, just a, a, a precious little, um, little guy just, just sharing with others. Hey, come, do, do you know that those who are at church, those who are disconnected, perhaps they moved here for a little bit and they're just not in the rhythm of church and it might, they might get out completely? A good portion of them would come if a family member or a child wanted to come. Passing out cars on the bus as a missionary. Amazing, practical, simple, a way to love, a way to be a lighthouse to others. What if we had this kind of invite culture here at Blue Course Community Church? For some, it might, the first step might be an event, a great way for them to get to know the church a little bit, to get to know others. End of summer celebration, I had great conversations with, with, with people from all over the world. Conversations I'd never have if I invited them, hey, come here and let's talk about Jesus. I might have that. But if I'm just watching their kids in the bounce house and they're talking about, hey, we appreciate you putting this on and uh, here's our life story and they're just opening up. Oh, what a great opportunity. 51% of those who are de-churched say they would come if they were invited by someone. And we have a unique situation because many say they'd come if they were invited by a new friend or if they had a new life circumstance. That's us. Being here, we have an opportunity to be a safe house for the hurting, those who are passing through. Maybe those who have experienced hard times in their, their other church and they're saying, like, I don't know if I'll, I'll ever give this thing a shot again. You know, their, their kids are disconnected and they're, they're not connected either. We have an opportunity to love them well. We have an opportunity to, to reach out to others well. And perhaps you're, you're passing through and hopefully during this time we can equip you well. To be a healthy church in a de-churched age. Let's strive to be a safe house for the hurting. If that's you, either here in person or maybe you're listening online thinking, will I give this church thing a shot or not? We want you to know that we care. And I hope that we can be a church and trust that we are a church that can reflect the love of our Savior who is gentle and lowly in heart. Unfortunately, we will fail to do that perfectly. But he will never fail you. And I hope that we can be a place where you can come and be equipped to know what you believe and why you believe it. I think that will help you personally and allow you to be patient with others as they wrestle through their doubts and questions. I also hope that we can reflect Christ to the world around us, a lighthouse to the nations. What a tremendous opportunity that we have to show that Jesus is good, beautiful, and true. Let's pray together. Dear Father, we thank you for the wonderful hope that we have in Jesus. Jesus loves and welcomes. He is gentle and lonely in heart. Father, help us to be able to reflect that. Help us to reach others with the good news of Jesus. That because of him, because of who he is, we can have hope not only for this life, but for the life to come. It's in Jesus' name we pray.